Hello and welcome to Domicile Corporate Services podcast series Advance in Vietnam with me Vlad Savin and Matthew Lowry. Throughout the following episodes we'll look into answering relevant questions about doing business in Vietnam. What are the opportunities and challenges faced by investors entering the market or existing players in major industries? We will seek to understand the business environment from a cultural and local mindset and how to deal with compliance from an international perspective. What are the major risks faced by businesses active in the region and how to overcome them? And uh, last but not least, we will dive deep into the compliance environment in Vietnam, discussing processes and procedures, changes in laws, latest official updates from the authorities, and financial governance planning for businesses active in Vietnam. In this episode, I'm discussing with Matthew Lowry, Managing Partner at Domicile Corporate Services, about the most consequential mistakes for investors make after establishing their business in Vietnam and advice on how to avoid these problems from the beginning or how to mitigate the risks if we, they could have been avoided. Matthew, welcome to our sixth episode of Advanced in Vietnam podcast series. Glad to have you here. Uh, thank you, Vlad. Always happy to share some practical information regarding these sort of matters. And uh, yeah, I've seen many of these issues appear more than once with foreign investors. Correct. We constantly see problems arising due to poor or missing advice or investors not appreciating or understanding the Vietnam specific initial obligations once their company has been established. You've dealt with many types of investors over the years, and I think it would be very straightforward for you to spot these mistakes. But when investors don't have a cultural background adapted to the country, issues often appear, and if not attended to, they impact the health and efficiency of the new established entity. One of the first and main mistakes investors make is to delay the chapter capital injection into the direct capital account of the new entity, exceeding the 90-day requirements. Can you explain what this means? Uh, thanks, Vlad. So the, that 90-day requirement regarding the charter capital comes back to the fact that um, all companies, foreign or local, are required to um, have the committed capital, the share capital as for, you know, for a foreign context, injected within 90 days. And that doesn't change foreign or local. The difference with foreign foreign investors is that capital must come from abroad or foreign funds and it must come in a certain way. So the first part is when setting up a company, there is a committed level of charter capital. As I said, effectively the share capital of a company, even though most limited liability companies in Vietnam don't specifically have shares, it's a divided ownership. So that you are committing on application to invest a certain amount of this charter capital within 90 days of establishment. That's the, the commitment. Um, locally, that money can be put in, bank account deposited, you're done. A foreign investor must come into the direct investment capital account in most cases. And that a direct investment capital account is a specific account for receiving foreign capital or loans or dividends. It's that account to control the equity, the in and out. By using that account, if you sell your company, you can take your money back out and your profits, and it makes a foreign investor have this flexibility. But by not bringing it in 90 days, you effectively, the, the, back, the, the, the direct investment capital account will not be able to receive those funds. If you've got a frozen company, you have not committed, not brought in the funds you said you'd bring in, and that the bank won't let you bring the money in, even if you wanted to. So the only way around it is seek extensions from the um, the Department of Planning and Investment. It's complicated, not always possible, and you may end up with a company that you've established that you can't meet the commitments, you can't put funding in, and you've got a, a, a significant problem that is, can be very hard to work around. And one more question on the capital. Uh, we all, all often see for investors um, not understanding what is the minimal requirement. So what happens, for example, if if uh, an investor will will put in the charter capital, but it doesn't have that, that minimum approach. Um, we saw recently uh, in the press a Vietnamese, I think it was a real estate company uh, based out of Hanoi, who mistakenly put down um, the billions of dollars of US dollars as the capital and a mistake. Now, the law says they've got to inject that within 90 days. Now, that was a mistake. Someone put wrong zeros on things and, and they laugh about it. But that's that. once you have those funds written down, on the application, they're accepted, you are committed to bring those in. So that I, I often have seen historically, uh, more so than recently, people put very large inflated figures going, it doesn't matter, well, it does. You've got to bring in what you state. Now on the minimum side, 
most business lines don't have a specific documented minimum in law. Um, certain real estate businesses do, um, but as a general rule, the vast majority don't have a specific minimum. Um, it depends on sector. It depends on a foreign investor is held to a higher account. They're regarded as needing a higher minimum by the authorities than a local company. Otherwise, why would they invest in foreign funds? So it is at a higher standard, but there's no specific minimum. And it could be for some service companies, $10,000 or $20,000 US for a foreign investor. For a manufacturer, it might be $100,000. For a distributor, it might be $50,000. It depends on the business case and what they're applying for, but it can't be $1,000 or $500. The authorities will not accept that as being appropriate capitalized business. And just keep in mind, the whole charter capital is to capitalize your business to have sufficient funds to operate and to successfully operate a business. And if you don't put down sufficient funding, the authorities will not accept that in the application. And Matthew, investors often disregard the initial tax and compliance registrations with the authorities. How do these work? Yeah, so once the company's established, you've got a certain um, time period, less than or up to 30 days to deal with your post-licensing registrations. So they include both paying your annual company fee, your business license tax, as it's called. You've got to pay that within, the, uh, not the first month, but um, it's within um, the month that you are established as a certain um, trigger point where you've got to pay your annual fee, and then you'll pay it every year after that in January. But you also your tax registrations. You have to do your company registration just because your tax number will be the same as your company number. Unless you specifically register, you're not in the tax system. Then you've got to do your VAT. So you've got to register your VAT um, system and, and choices. You've got to then do electronic um, registration for e-invoicing, e and then you've got to finalise the invoicing registration. That process takes time, and people often start the company and go, great, I can start um, issuing invoices. No, you can't until you have done your VAT registrations. You can't. So it really does, even though your company is established, it disrupts your ability to issue invoices and it will disrupt your ability to actually claim deductions for the period where you're not registered. Um, so you've got to make sure that you're not trying to run your business until you've done your registration. So the date your company is established, um, it, can, it's, it, it legally can do things, but you will have tax consequences unless you have completed and understood those post post-licensing registrations. And predominantly, you, you actually have periods within the first 30 days effectively to complete them, including registering your bank account with the authorities. You need to open an operating account, register with authorities as part of that tax process. We often see foreign investors using a Vietnamese nominee investor to start a company. What are the risks attached to this practice and how should what should you investors do instead? So on the surface, it's always a dangerous. There are situations where it, it, it may be a, an appropriate course, but generally using a nominee is dangerous. And, and the, the reference from a legal perspective is that there is no nominee, or, nominee law or trust law in Vietnam. So someone who's named as the owner of business is the owner in, 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 in essence. So the idea that I'll, I'll get a nominee, it's okay, well, I might trust someone today, but do I trust them tomorrow? What if that business is worth something? You you have to really consider the ability to enforce if you are the beneficial owner. And the mindset of many foreign investors coming from common law countries is that I'm the beneficial owner, I can control it. Um, that may not be the case in Vietnam when you're looking through to the ownership is the owner, the name on the, name on the investment certificate. Um, so the first part is that is enforcement, this right that you don't necessarily have a right to it. Oh, I trust my lawyer, it's in his name. Well, trust is one thing, factual evidence is another and trying to enforce that. The next part is that whenever you lend money to pay for your nominee to do things, that you're, you're gifting that money, trying to get that money back out. If it doesn't come in through the capital account we discussed for, earlier, either as loan or, um, or as investment capital, doesn't come in through that account, it is not committed to, be, to leave Vietnam. So you're locking money in. Finally, if you went to transfer ownership from your nominee, because some people use nominees to do things faster and then transfer, you've got to buy it back. You've got to bring that money in Vietnam to show that you're buying that capital off someone. And if you've already put the money in the first place, you've got to buy that money back. Because from a legal perspective, you haven't. That's someone else's money, not yours. And you'll have to bring more money in to buy out their capital. So all of that is a very clunky and a dangerous position. 
Now, I said there are potentially scenarios. There are some restricted sectors where you need to have a Vietnamese investor. And there are legal methods with offshore foreign investors. You could do some protection to protect against and do structures. But that's not an um, avenue which most investors would be comfortable with or is appropriate. So where you have restricted sectors that require a Vietnamese involvement or restrictions, be very careful, speak to your lawyers and understand the options that you have, but, by, but understand that on the surface, um, using a local nominee does, really does expose you financially and ownership wise sort of the risk for your business. Many investors don't pay attention to the 30 day residence requirement for the legal representative of the, of the newly formed company. What does this provision state and how businesses can maintain compliance? Okay, so the 30 day um, rule for regarding residence is something that was introduced in 2015. And it, the law says that a company must have at least one legal representative. So a legal representative um, holds the assets and operates the company. And just to get in context, um, in a common law context, a company has individual powers. In Vietnam, it's not quite like that. A company only has individual powers when affected by a legal representative because they represent the company. So of those legal representatives, you can have one or more. At least one of them is required to reside in Vietnam. That's the test when you're registering the company and ongoing. Um, and further to that, if they are outside Vietnam for more than 30 days, the law requires the company to appoint another legal representative. So basically, you need to have at least one legal representative in Vietnam every 30 days, or you are in breach. And at this time we're recording this podcast, the borders are still closed in Vietnam, as they are in most parts of the world. And the ability for some, if someone is the sole legal representative, or if all legal representatives are outside Vietnam, there is a risk that they are in breach of the enterprise law, that they are not in country and therefore the company is exposed, individually exposed about executing their duties and the company's um, obligations to have a legal representative in the country every 30 days. So in those situations, we encourage an additional legal representative to be appointed who is residing in Vietnam, particularly that we don't know how long and the borders will remain closed or partially closed. And that way would um, mitigate the potential risks of something being deemed invalid because the, uh, the legal rep was not in country. Um, there are methods to limit the authority, so you may you may have a method in place whereby one legal representative um, has to get approval for certain things. Uh, so that can be explored in certain scenarios of how that works. But the important thing is to have on the business license, the enterprise registration certificate, um, named an additional legal representative if everyone's outside country, so that the company remains compliant and doesn't breach this thirty day rule. One, one other mistake we see a lot is making undocumented loans or not registering foreign loans with the state bank. How do these loans work and what should investors do to be compliant? So as mentioned earlier, that the loans, if you don't bring them in the correct way, are stuck in country. You can't get them out. So the, the idea is a foreign loan has to come into the country through a specified bank account. Now, that is either the direct investment capital account, the same account that your charter capital comes in foreign investors. Or if it's a local company and doesn't have a direct investment capital account, they can use what's open, what's called an overseas loan account. So it's a specific bank account that the bank will use for bringing in, um, allowing foreign loans to come into the country. Now, if the loan is less than 30 days, it generally does not need registering with the authorities, with the state bank or other authorities. You can bring it in, use those funds and repatriate those funds when ready. If the loan is more than thirty, more than sorry, more than twelve months, um, then it is required to be registered with the state bank, and there's a quarterly, ongoing, um, online um, filing that you need to do in respect to those loans. So the failure to register loans, particularly if they go from short term to medium term, if they go from less than twelve months to longer than twelve months, can actually cause a problem in repatriating funds because. Your, the bank who received the money into that special bank account no longer can let it out because it doesn't breach the requirements. Or if the funds don't come into Vietnam correctly in the first place. And a lot of the time you see someone and the investors lend money directly to a company, to their normal bank account, or to individuals to put into a company. If those foreign loans don't come in correctly, they cannot go out correctly from a foreign currency perspective. There is the one further point, and I have seen this, where um, where loans have come in 
to a company account directly domestically and not gone through the foreign bank account process, they've come there, where the authorities have deemed them to be revenue in nature, given the nature of the relationships, and that um, unless there is, because the loans weren't registered, they were a certain type, and because of that, they denied accepting the loan documents. Now, that's not necessarily a precedent for what would happen, but I'm just emphasising that there are complications further than just simply the loan not being able to be um, repatriated out of country that can arise. And extinguishing a loan where you can't pay the owner, the foreign party sent that money to a company, the company can't extinguish the loan because there's no bank account domestically they can pay to. That's an also another procedural problem that, that presents problems, it presents an issue. So um, always, if money's coming from abroad, always stop, breathe, make sure it comes into a correct account so it can be repatriated and it doesn't cause consequential problems for um, local or foreign owned companies in Vietnam. Not appointing a chief accountant and not understanding the role is a major issue because of the importance of the chief accountant position in the organization. We actually have a full episode dedicated to this topic here at Advancing Vietnam Podcast Series. You can check it out for more information. Why is it this important, Matthew? Well, the chief accountant, and that, that podcast goes through a lot of details on this, but just the summary version is that the chief accountant is one of the statutory positions of a company. A chief accountant is like is quasi the company secretary that you'd see in other countries where we don't have that position in a Vietnamese enterprise. Um, and they have this the role for signing and being part of all accounting transactions, but also having other obligations for lodging and ensuring the ongoing compliance of the company. By not appointing a chief accountant or understanding the role, um, you have difficulties in opening bank accounts where bank accounts should have the chief accountant as a signature on their really requirements. And that... Um, making sure your registrations are done properly, making sure things are being filed and making sure that there aren't mistakes, particularly in the early period, is really important. Now, there are exemptions in the uh, law and accounting in respect to the first 12 months and micro companies. However, those exemptions still require the individual who is named as chief accountant to have the same skills and qualifications and experience as a chief accountant does, which means that it is hard for someone who is not um, a, a really across the chief accountant regulations to take that temporary role and it's also the most dangerous time because in the first period is where your registrations and your mistakes will generally happen when you're dealing with the authorities the authorities will liaise in most cases through the chief accountant and they will use them as that point of contact and so therefore having someone competent qualified and registering properly is the most uh, practical way to protect the company by doing the opposite you're exposing the company and it's it's a risk where um, you wouldn't want an unqualified tax agent looking after your business. And that is essentially what happens if you do have a chief accountant who is not qualified or experienced. Let's do it the local way and we fix it later. Type of mindset is often prevalent for investors establishing their business in Vietnam. I think the most important mistake we often see is this wrong business mindset. We're cutting corners and doing things fast, cheap, and most of the times non compliant is a major problem. Why do you think this mindset is not productive and how would you advise investors to adjust their thinking to the Vietnamese market, but keeping their international perspective as well? Yeah, the, uh, the local way, we'll fix it later. Just do it the local way. Um, dangerous and, and sometimes can't be re uh, repaired. We, we commonly see situations where a, a foreign investor will come to us and try to help them and we end up having to start a new company and do it again at a significantly higher cost with the corrective actions because of those mistakes. So we've talked about a few of them, them bringing the money in the wrong way, using a nominee, um, and we've seen nominees actually require payment to transfer those their, their capital. Um, and we've seen the tax registrations, bank accounts, um, but particularly documentation, the, the invoices. Oh, let's pay cash, not get an invoice, it's cheaper that way. Well, if it can't go through the books, it's not cheap because you don't get tax deduction for it. You don't get your VAT credit for it. And it's cost you 30% instead of saving, trying to save 10% VAT, which is often the approach. And the idea of not putting things through the books, um, it's okay, we can create it later. I've got a local account who will just put together what we need to for the authorities means that when you have an inspection, the authorities are smarter than what we give credit to. The invoicing means a, much of the economy in Vietnam is going through this, the tax office records. They understand. We also know that if a due, someone wants to come in and invest and they do due diligence, they can't verify the veracity of claims around income, revenues and expenses because they haven't been done properly or the documents don't support. Each one of them represents an exposure and a risk. This 
um, don't worry, trust me, it'll work itself out. And the, and the investor is not a, across what is happening, does not see the documents. And when they do, sort of this shock and fear that we see on their faces because the local way, oh, I've always done it, we'll pay up the capital later, doesn't matter. Those sort of things can present significant roadblocks. So I just always tell investors, when foreign investors come into Vietnam, take the high road, take international best practice. The local path will cost you more. It'll cost you more in the short run and in the long run. If you're maintaining two or three sets of books, then that's gonna cost you more just to maintain them, let alone the tax risks, the compliance risks, the transactional risks that exist, investment risks, just doing multiple sets of books, which is not uncommon in Vietnam. I've seen clients, not clients, I've seen um, parties with, um, with one set for the bank, one set for the tax man, one set for the real books, um, one set for the other investor. To, <laughs> so you, you see those sort of things and it's not conducive because that's cost, that's risk and that's cost. So do it compliantly, understand the compliance and just do it properly. And that way that international best practice mindset is cheaper, easier, faster, and it puts less stress. But that way, run the business. Don't, don't run the back end, run the front end, run the, the profit making part of the business because there is more opportunity in Vietnam on the front end to go out and be successful than there is trying to hide and play around and do it the local way in the back end. Thank you for sharing these practical tips, Matthew. Unfortunately, our time is up. But Greece, great speaking with you. Uh, you're very much welcome, Vlad, and uh, all, always happy to help and have a discussion. Establishing a company in Vietnam is a significant step for many investors and hopefully the beginning of a successful business undertaking. However, mistakes that are made in the beginning of this endeavor can often have a substantial impact on the operations and ultimate success of this business. The best way to mitigate these mistakes, try to avoid them by always being aware and informed about the legal and compliance requirements in Vietnam. Many thanks to you, our listeners, for tuning in to Advance in Vietnam podcast series. For more information about this topic, please check out our publications on domicilecf.com. And if you want to reach out to us for any additional details, feel free to contact myself or Matthew on LinkedIn or through the website contact details.